come. Um, so enhancing passwords then, and I have subtitled it Life Support for Cybersecurity's Walking Dead. And I shall explain why just in a second. So a bit of a scene setting. Firstly, the fact that, well, depending on where you read, passwords are dead and they've been dead for some time, other than the fact that the vast majority of you in the room put your hands up to say you're still using them. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about how we use passwords, the way in which we're encouraged to use them, and the degree of support or otherwise that we as users get and perhaps we as organizations provide to users for using them effectively. And then some experimental results relating to something that we did looking at whether providing password guidance, feedback in different ways can improve people's behavior with them. And then finally, some conclusions. Passwords are dead, according to this uh, particular set of headlines. So going back quite some time there, Microsoft security expert declares password dead. Google says password dead. Passwords are just generally dead. And there's a gravestone that I created for them. So we can commemorate the loss of passwords. Other than the fact that quite clearly, by the show of hands, they're still here. And we're still using them. So perhaps we would like them to be dead, and certainly what Alan was talking about earlier in terms of the use of biometrics offers something that is perhaps friendlier, more convenient for us, but we still get stuck with passwords in many situations. How many of you like passwords as a means of authentication? How many of you actively dislike passwords? Okay. And how many of you don't care, just bring on the food, please? Okay, a few of you. I feel the same, but I felt somebody ought to fill the time. OK, so, well, here we are, something from uh, October of 2016. I received something like this through the mail. Bye-bye, um, passwords. So long, farewell. There's a biometric that can replace you, according to this. So at the time, new voice ID from HSBC. Anybody um, experience this, used it? Nobody? OK, anybody enjoy logging into online banking with the, the various secret things you have to remember and the tokens you have to use and making sure you're scratching your foot at the same time? Yeah, yeah so you have that. Some of you have that experience anyway. Um, but OK, passwords are gone, bye bye and all of that. But, and yet we still regularly see things like this. So some websites that you may have heard of that, that still seem to use passwords as a primary authentication mechanism. And there are still various requirements for us to be guided on passwords. So as many just now had the NCSE's tips on phishing, there is a similar flyer about passwords that you can download from the NCSE site. They've got a variety of decent resources that you can download, these sort of infographics and guidance sheets. So if you need something to pass towards staff, employees, etc., good source to utilize. And the fact that they thought it necessary, and one of the first sets of guidance that they put out was about passwords. So this dead technology, we still seem to need a lot of support to make sure we're using it appropriately. And it's saying things on here to try and give some insight into how passwords are broken, and perhaps some surprisingly standard advice on how to improve our usage. None of that is particularly new. This is guidance that in some shape or form has been around for years, but many people still don't seem to use it by default. So, let's give some thought to some of the things that people like yourselves in a past survey that we did, and in this case of over 400 UK-based respondents, looking at the difference between the adult respondents, if we use that term, the 18s and overs, and respondents under 18. So the upcoming generation who, to be honest, have grown up with technology being around them all the time, and surely, therefore, we as parents, employers, society, have done a better job of trying to let those people know how to use passwords more effectively than basically the adults who've been mucking it up for years because they don't, don't know or care any better. So let's have a look. Um, so firstly, 
just picking on how many passwords do people have to manage. Now, the question here was not how many different passwords do people have, which might have yielded a different response, but how many different things, websites, devices, etc., do people have to use passwords for? Now, this was done originally in 2012, this particular set, so this is based on a slightly different set of data than the other slides, but a third say they have 16 or more things that they use passwords on. How many of you have 16 or more things, devices, websites, etc., that you have to have a password for? Um, yes, I thought that would be the vast majority. So just, just bear with me. How many of you have 16 different passwords, or more, a distinct password for all of those things? Not so many hands, I notice, in that particular case. So there's already... An, uh, an indication within the room that one of the bits of standard advice that we would be dealt for passwords, use a different password on everything that you use, is not something that we're necessarily abiding by. And possibly the reason for that is, it's actually quite difficult to manage and think about different passwords for every single thing. How many of you have a set of passwords that you use and redeploy, if that's the right word, depending on the device or the service you're using? Okay, so a fair, uh, uh, more than a third, possibly less than half of the room. Okay, so we can see there from our respondents at that time that they have varying levels. Um, relatively few people had less than five passwords or one to five passwords. Now this contrast back to our 400 respondents in total between the under 18s and the over 18s. What we asked them here was to think about the password protecting their most significant account or thing. So the password they felt was the most important one they had. And then to think about what characteristics that password possessed. So was it at least eight characters long? And that's not to suggest that eight characters is in any way the utopian target to aim for. But as we shall see as we go forward, it's about the best minimum length that some st popular websites would tend to insist upon. Did they have a password that was alphanumeric, so using alphabetic characters and numbers? Did their password include other characters, so punctuation symbols, for example? And was their password a dictionary word? Obviously, we didn't want them to say that. And was their password based on personal information? And we didn't want them to say that either, for reasons around social engineering. You may have heard of social engineering. Um, and did they use the same password on every system? And we can see in the red, there are our under 18s, in the blue is the over 18, or 18s and overs. And we can see there that the, the younger generation, who really ought to be getting taught to do things better, are generally doing things demonstrably worse than the other people. And the other people aren't doing things remarkably well either. So if we took, if I remember rightly, all the positive characteristics that we wanted to have, so at least eight characters, alphanumeric, including other characters, not a dictionary word and not personal information, about a quarter of the adult respondents had a password that satisfied those five criteria. So even where they were good in some things, they weren't always good in others. And this is standard baseline password advice. It's nothing new. It's the sort of thing that we've been guided towards, or <laughs> at least we're meant to have been guided towards for years. And as uh, Alan showed earlier, there's a, a variety of well-known passwords that, that people tend to gravitate towards. So I've got them here from the splash data samples from 2013 through to 2016. If we took the 2017 or 2018 versions and put them up there, it's not remarkably different. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six seems to be a, a, a highly popular choice, um, perhaps because all the numbers are in a line, or perhaps, well, maybe equally, because on, for example, mobile devices, if you think about your passcode, let's say on a, an iPhone or something like that, a six-digit passcode is the standard default one that it asks you for. So why not? One, two, three, four, five, six. Nobody would guess it. It's easy to remember. Um, other thing, I mean, password. Who would have thought the word password? Anybody use the word password as their password? Come on, you can tell. Don't put, put your hand down. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you, you, yeah, so hopefully more thought would go into it than some of these things. Um, football, well. Um, so a variety of choices that if you wanted, and I'm not saying you should, in fact I'll say you shouldn't, but if you wanted to try and break into somebody's system, then trying these sort of things would be perhaps a starting point, because many people apparently seem to choose them. 
So don't do that, by the way. So looking back to January 2012, um, there's apparently quite a move away from passwords in terms of uh, the technology we're trying to promote. So DARPA, um, in that year, launched their active authentication program. And basically, you can see here the, the underlying motivation for it is to try and enable us to move away from password technology as the authentication mechanism of choice, so to speak. So there has been work done in that space, some of the things around biometrics, some of the things around transparent monitoring of users to verify identity, that all contributes towards this, but we still see passwords are there. Similarly, Horizon 2020 um, call for proposals around uh, digital security. Again, one of the specific challenges, you can see, I won't read all the text out, but you can again see it's framed around passwords being something that it's basically out of date, not fit for purpose, and therefore needs to be replaced. So research is required in order to find alternatives. OK, so we know passwords are not optimal. And you know, a lot of the advice would say that, well, a lot of the, the headlines would say they're dead. A lot of the advice would say we need to use them better. So let's have a look, based on something that I wrote um, a couple of years ago now, looking at um, the 10 leading websites, 10 most popular websites amongst us when we use things, based on what the Alexa Global Top 500 said back in August 2014. So I did this particular study then. I've done it twice prior to that, going back over a decade. And uh, yeah, let's have a see what these sites do in terms of guiding users, in terms of selecting passwords for their, their accounts. So the first question then is, when you go to sign up for one of these services, do you get any guidance on the password you're being asked to choose. Because they'll say, sign up here, click to sign up, you provide a username, you type a password. But is there any guidance provided by these sites in order to help you? And you can see, at least at the time I did this assessment, so things might have changed slightly now in some cases, but only two of them, Google and WordPress, uh, actually provided any guidance, any tips on the screen, any links to follow about what a good password ought to look like, or indeed how to manage the password that you've chosen. Uh, slightly different if you elected to change your password at a later point. So now Google still Google is consistent across the board. It provided guidance at all stages. WordPress no longer does, but now LinkedIn chips in and says, OK, here's some guidance. Perhaps if you've forgotten your password um, or you decided you change, want to change it, you need guidance on how to do it better. And at the point of password reset, which is particularly going to be in response to, I've forgotten my password, I need it reset, we can now see more sites coming through with guidance at that point, because perhaps the users demonstrated that they couldn't remember the password they previously chose, so they need some more support to choose the next one better. But overall, there's quite a lot of red on this, particularly at this point when somebody's signing up. So if this is somebody who hasn't had much exposure to, to using the systems before, perhaps might even be their first time choosing a password, how do they know how to do it appropriately if no support is provided? OK, so you might be thinking at this point, yeah, yeah, but um, people know about passwords. They know what to do. And in any case, the sites probably stop them from choosing dumb passwords anyway. They'll, they'll have some sort of rigorous checks to ensure that these users will ultimately, whether they're guided directly or not, choose a password that works appropriately. Apparently not. So looking now at the various things that uh, at sign up, so when you're first registering on the service, they did, again, they varied a bit as to whether they enforced restrictions at password change or reset. But looking at the minimum length that they would accept, whether they would accept the surname, whether, or whether they would check to prevent the surname, right? check to prevent the user ID, check to prevent the use of the word password, check the composition of the password, and prevent the use of dictionary words. So what we can see here is, as I mentioned, about the best of the bunch in terms of minimum accepted password length was eight. So others would accept less than eight characters. Um, so you can see six character minimums being the, the more common. And Wikipedia didn't care about a minimum password length. You could have a one-character password. 
Amazon at least got better in that respect. When I first did this uh, bit of investigation back in 2007, Amazon would let you have a one-character password as well, and then you could happily store your payment card details and all your other personal information protected by that single character. As, as we can see, Amazon didn't get a hell of a lot better, though, on the rest of it, so they, they still provided, at the time, no support for anything else. So, some of the sites, but the minority of them prevented the use of the user's surname as their password. Many allowed, the, or some rather, allowed the reuse of the user's user ID. Some of them, surprisingly enough, didn't prevent the use of the word password as the password. And all these checks are perfectly viable to make. Very few of them checked the composition of the password to see if you were using alphanumeric and punctuation characters. So many would just let you get away with a, a numeric only or alphabetic only password. And some of them made no checks around dictionary words. And then there was, what we also looked at was, was there any other support such as a password meter to give the user some feedback? Any extra protections, such as the ability to sign up for one-time codes for authentication, to use a, an app for one-time codes, anything like that being provided, and whether the, the site, when you came to password change or reset, would prevent you reusing a password you'd previously used. And again, you can see that the performance and the behavior is inconsistent. So over time, as I say, I've done this investigation a few times, and so we can see the number of sites that did the checks. It sort of got better over time, but it's still not, not perfect by any means. So, okay, back in, uh, back in uh, 20, 2007, two sites would check that there was at least eight characters. Now three of them will do so. Um, but the picture is still that sites will let you get away with quite poor password practice compared to what the guidance would typically tell us if we provided the guidance. So for those sites that were consistent throughout the studies, those are the ones, the five that appeared in all uh, versions of the, the investigation. Others came in and out of the Alexa top, um, top list um, over time. So we can see there, that, as I say, Amazon hasn't got that much better, to be perfectly honest. Um, Google was not bad to begin with and has got better since. Um, Microsoft and Yahoo, Yahoo getting a tick all the way across. But again, this isn't rocket science stuff, and still some of those sites weren't providing the guidance up front. So, okay, ultimately there's a safety net there to prevent some of the, the poor choices, but nothing necessary to explain to people why those restrictions were being applied. So having some guidance would perhaps make it easier for people to buy in. Okay, so enforcement of length was variable, other checks were often excluded, some sites did inform you your password could be stronger, have you considered doing this, but didn't actually force you to do so. But of course, some sites might say, yeah, but you know, the, the password we're ex accepting from people is commensurate with the, the level of sensitivity of the data they're storing. Perhaps they don't need to worry about protecting this service to that degree, although I'm sure somebody like Amazon, where you're storing your payment card details, wouldn't have that defense to spring to mind. But maybe for something like Wikipedia, you would think, OK, my account isn't storing such sensitive information. But of course, anything that users get away with here, they might think is appropriate, given that these are leading sites, if it's appropriate for them, why is it not appropriate in other contexts to use passwords in exactly the same way? And meanwhile, some of them, as you saw there with Twitter previously, they offer a password meter. So they give you a bit of feedback to tell you if you're on the right lines, even though perhaps your password that they're rating is still poor. So here, I've typed a password, and Twitter says it's weak. Weak. It's not very nice. Um, what it doesn't tell me is why it's weak. So I've, I've just now had a, a judgment passed on my character, my password, whatever. Something is weak, but I don't know why. Um, Yahoo, similarly, oh, it's a bigger red line here. Um, more words. Your password is weak. Please create a stronger password. How? So I now, I now feel inadequate. I've chosen a weak password. I'm told to do it better. I thought I was doing it well before, but apparently not. It's weak, and it was weak there. How do I do it better? Well, I don't know. Um, because that was my best guess, and I've been rated weak. No guidance on either of them as to how I could go about doing it in a better way. 
So we're told the password's too weak. What we want to know is why, what can we do about it, and why should I care anyway? What does it matter to me if I have a weak password on Twitter, if I have a weak password on Facebook, Amazon? Perhaps the site could give me a reminder, because I'm a bit thick, as to what I'm trying to protect through this password, so I understand why I should put some effort into it. So one thing that we did further to this, having seen that sites don't provide much guidance and support, is initially with a very small scale investigation, 27 participants, two different versions of a website, where we asked them to create an account so that they could then participate in a survey activity. They weren't told that they were being rated on their passwords at all. We got ethics clearance for deceiving them, by the way. But we then observed the ways that the two different groups worked. One of the sites, when they selected their password, had no guidance whatsoever, other than being told not to reuse one from a previous account. The other version had guidance around, just as a list of bullet points, to choose at least eight characters, make it alphanumeric, to use punctuation symbols, avoid dictionary words, and avoid personal information. And what we can see here is that the guided users, there was no enforcement of any of these rules. It was still entirely up to them if they complied with it. We can see that the guided users, even though they're small samples in each case, did much better than those that were left to their own devices. So this was interesting, just from a small sample though, but interesting that just putting the guidance on the screen made a difference. You know, user awareness, who knew? Um, so, we then thought, OK, let's do it a little bit more and investigate different modes of feedback for people as well. So now we had 300 participants, 60 participants um, into five different scenarios. That's about right, yeah. Um, so participants, again, weren't told that they were involved in a study that was looking at passwords. They were told they needed to create an account this time to complete a survey about their social media usage. And again, just to reassure those of you that are concerned, we got ethics approval for deceiving them. So, five different variants of this experiment or this scenario. First one looked like this. No guidance at all, other than a bit of basic advice, as I say again, please don't reuse a password you already use elsewhere. Other than that, standard username box and two entries of the password just to make sure they could remember it between typing it there and there. Okay, that bit looked the same in all of the scenarios. Um, next one, now some basic guidance, pretty much like the other experiment with the 27 participants that had. Your password should be eight or more characters, upper or lower and lowercase letters, at least one number and one special character. Um, dictionary words and personal information should not be used. So the standard baseline, you know, uh, motherhood and apple pie password guidance. The next one, next variant, so just to remind you, that bit and this actually now stayed the same in all the later variants. So all of the subsequent ones still had this guidance on the screen as well. But what we did now was introduce the use of a password meter, a fairly standard looking password meter where people could enjoy the experience of being rated weak, just like I had, um, medium or strong, so three different levels of rating, um, different levels of score would put it over different thresholds there. So the sort of thing they might be used to seeing on standard websites. Experiment scenario four decided to give the feedback in a slightly different way. So rather than a traditional meter, we now have little emojis. So sad face in red, if somebody hasn't got a good password, through to green smiley face. If you've got a green face, you're not necessarily normally going to be smiling about it. But anyway, green to signify good and a smiley face. And the thought here was, well, perhaps people will be more incentivized if they're keeping the computer happy. The system will like them. They want to get approval. And so, again, interesting to see whether this made any difference. And the final scenario was, again, the emoji feedback, but this time with a more emotive style of message. Not just weak, medium, strong, but this, that's not good enough. But you could do better. Well done. So a bit of praise, a little pat on the head, etc., for the user. And so it's interesting to see whether this made any difference at all to how people behaved. And just with the last experiment scenario, there was no enforcement of any of the password rules. They could still have one, two, three, four as their password if they really wished to. So in terms of the scoring, um, 
We use the password scoring algorithms in GitHub, just some examples of the sort of passwords and the sort of scores they would get into the different ranges that we split things into for the, for the password meter part of it and to give the different colors of emoji there. Um, just for the benefit of the students, Luke 23 gets 50 points, and that's only if you put an uppercase letter with it. You'll get the meaning of that at a later point in time if you haven't already. Um, and here's our results from the different scenarios. So we see for scenario one, we're now looking at the proportion of passwords scored in the different categories. So surprise, surprise, for scenario one, where there was no guidance at all, three quarters of the password choices ended up being weak. And about a quarter of them there were rated medium. But immediately you get any sort of guidance, so just five bullet points on the screen beside the password selection box, we now see a jump in terms of the medium rated and a significant drop in terms of those rated weak. Still not got many strong passwords, but look at the difference in those rated weak. We've, we've already got an improvement. Then with the password meter giving some sort of traditional feedback, we get a marginal change there. A bit more of a change in terms of the use of the emojis. So by the, the final scenario, where we've got the happy smiley face or sad face and the emotive message, We've now managed to achieve 12% of strong passwords, no less, and weak passwords have gone down to a third. So we've not eliminated the weak passwords, of course, because some people will still do what they can get away with. The system didn't stop them. But some people have demonstrated that by virtue of the, fee the guidance and the feedback they've been given, it's affected their behavior in terms of what they're going to choose. Which is interesting, because you could probably apply this lesson to other aspects of security where we keep saying people don't do it right. Well, often people don't do it right because we don't guide people as to what they're supposed to do or encourage them in any way towards the right destination. So looking at the, the average scores, the average password length that were achieved from the different methods, I'm not sure how you get 0.8 of a, of a character, but nonetheless, we went from an average of 6.7 to 8.8 .8, um, from according to the guidance level provided. And as I say, no enforcement of the rules at all in any of the scenarios. So any form, there's a big emoji, any form of guidance seems to have a useful effect. So regardless of the use of the meter or the emojis, just that bullet point guidance was the most significant change that we saw. The emoji-based feedback gave better performance, possibly, because we've not extensively tested this further, possibly because the emoji-based feedback was novel. People weren't used to seeing that, whereas they were used to seeing standard password meters. So we can't say that prolonged exposure to this would have the same effect. If all sites used emojis to feedback, maybe people would become desensitized to it somewhat more. So still doesn't make passwords a perfect solution. We can still use them badly. There are still many aspects of their usage that this doesn't investigate, such as reusing passwords, sharing them with people, writing them down in discoverable places, and other things that I know you don't do. Um, but it does show that you can get some level of improvement on this gated technology if you support people to do it. Um, and I say, you could probably do similar things in terms of antivirus, where people sometimes, unless it's automated for them, unless they don't have to do anything, how many of you have manually scanned anything of yours in the last week? So a minority in the room, probably about a fifth of people. Okay, how many of you hope that the system's doing everything automatically for you? Okay, and many people then don't think it's being done automatically and haven't done it manually either. Mm -hmm. Right, um, backup, hands up for backup. Who does backup regularly? Oh, more for me. Probably a good idea, given that you're not scanning for malware. Um, and security updates, particularly where it says critical or security update. Have you, do you regularly apply those? Or do you defer the decision and say later, manana? Other options like that. Okay, so you're happy more... Still wasn't quite half of you, I don't think, but more hands at least went up. Remember, you're at a security event. These things are relevant. Um, so, <laughs> guidance and feedback, um, or nudges if you want to call it that, nudging people towards the right behavior are useful um, and ought to be provided by default. Certainly, the guidance element. I mean, how much does it cost in terms of effort for a site to put bullet points of guidance beside the choose a new password bit. Well, possibly 
They don't want to do that because that slows up your potential to sign up as a new user. It's putting a barrier in your way for sharing your name and your contact details, for example. But nonetheless, perhaps they should do it in order to make people behave in a more protected, secure manner. OK, if you want more content in this, this guys, there's the paper that I flagged up earlier on, which was from Computer Fraud and Security. There is on our podcast site an earlier version of those results, so talking about the 2011 version of the website assessment study. Other than that, and yeah, not too badly off in time for lunch, time for a couple of questions, um, contact details should you care. Thank you very much.